Hi marketers, this is Dots and welcome to the Marketing Leadership Podcast. With me here is Olua Femi Adeniba, the Executive Director of SourceMark Consult, and we will be talking about a roadmap to performance marketing efficiency. I know you guys are ready, so let's get it. Hey Femi, how are you doing? Welcome. What's up? I'm good. Yeah, great. Uh, it's really, really an honor to have you here on this episode. And, you know, we can't wait to get a lot of your marketing wisdom there. So can we really start from you telling us about yourself, uh, your background, your role, and, you know, how how far you've become when it comes to your career as a marketing leader? Okay, thank you very much. So a bit about myself. Um, um strongly faith-based. Uh, I'm a believer in Christ. And uh, over time, I discovered that uh, I get fulfillment in helping people gain clarity in life and business. I discovered I'm able to easily compartmentalize issues and connect the dots, no pun intended. To ah. many talented, <laughs> very content, you know, uh, in life and businesses. Uh, I'm married with uh, two lovely teenage girls and a charming boy. Well, uh, regarding to my background, I studied le electrical electronics from the Federal Polytechnic at uh telecoms option some years ago, and then proceeded to uh, University of Portsmouth where I did uh, BSc computing. And uh, after some years, I uh, got my executive MBA from the Lagos Business School and then um, IEC Business School in Barcelona, Spain. And uh, that's in uh, most of the academic qualifications gotten. Uh, I also have some certifications in the course of uh, transiting from IT, where I started my career in Procter & Gamble. I was outsourced to Hilliard Packard HP still in the workplace services IT uh, department. From there, I joined Friesland Campina. At Friesland Campina, I was in the IT department where I handled some enterprise projects. I was actually in the IT projects section. And uh, after some while, after a while, I actually became restless and um, there was an opening in marketing uh, where I became the first uh, uh, media manager and uh, the role was enriched to event and sponsorship and at the time I took a stint uh, at the Ghana uh, subsidiary of the business uh, for their media. Mm -hmm. um, I left paid employment some years ago, 2014 to be precise and uh, since then I've been on this entrepreneurial journey uh, where I started uh, SourceMark in 2016. And in 2018, I was um, called upon by one of the top three uh, global media buying companies, Stacom Media, uh, service Stacom Media to help reorganize their business. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the height of the pandemic, we had to, I had to leave the place and, uh, came back to my business, SourceMark, where mm -hmm. I lead the team as the executive director, more responsible for strategy, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, innovation in the business. I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. And if you're listening here, I uh, I want to give you guys a behind the scenes. So um, during the prep call, Femi was saying, why me? He was asking me, why me? And you guys can actually see why him. If you're, you can hear why him, if you, either you're watching this or you're viewing this, you can hear why him. That's quite a wrap. Like you've got quite a great experience with different organizations that are international uh, conglomerates and enterprise in nature. So uh, it's great what you've done. And right now you help, and I, be, I think it's fun for you at this point, helping companies around the world. C can yeah. you tell us about that and how, how that's going so far? Yeah, uh, thanks Dot. So helping company globally, um, it's fun for me, like, like you said. But beyond fun also, I also earn money from it. Uh, but there is um, a give back part of me, which I began last year, 
It's a 30 minute clarity session with uh, business owners in the SME space uh, where I engage with business owners to understand what their pains are regarding to the aspect of marketing. And uh, it will surprise you to know that a lot of business owners think of marketing as an afterthought. Yeah. You know, they, they don't think marketing at the point of building the business. They are more engrossed with the products than how will I market it? You know, uh, not many of them are acquainted with uh, the BMC uh, model of business uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when every section and input of the BM BMC, the canvas is uh, well linked together, the aspect mm -hmm. of marketing will be clearer. So for the few that are a bit intentional about marketing, you know, I also discovered that they were not very clear as to what the picture of success is going to look like. Mm. So you're doing an activity which for one reason or the other, you don't know how to measure. Mm -hmm. So when the output is coming out, you don't even know if it's working or not. And for the, lead, for the few that seem to understand, you know, they don't know how to further optimize what is working. So mm -hmm. that session for me uh, is very enlightening for me and also very enriching for them. Uh, opened my eyes to a similarity that cuts across business owners regarding how they handle marketing. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think people assume, um, oh, I use Google every day. I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn, so I should be able to market. There, there is no appreciation on the science <laughs> of marketing. There is no appreciation right. that when it comes to ranking industries that have made so much money in the history of mankind, that marketing ranks in the top, in the very, very top, you know. Um, so I, I think, you know, having you in that space and, you know, is this, I think this is something that is worthy of emulation from my perspective as well is helping to clear up that mindset to say there is a science to this and there are steps that need to be taken and you know um i was interviewing someone recently and said you know and she said marketing is a lot of work it's not like you do it haphazardly you you know it, it, there's a lot of strategy there's a lot of implementation there's a lot of labor there's a lot of transparency required and transparency is not easy so yeah i i do agree with you on that so now let's get into the topic at hand, uh, you know, uh, roadmap to performance marketing efficiency and doing more with less. So what is performance marketing efficiency? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Dot, there, there is so much buzzwords uh, flying around, mm -hmm. you know, nowadays mm -hmm. that um, uh, people seem to get so entwined with a boss word and uh, they lose the meaning yeah. of the term itself. So before I delve into performance marketing efficiency, let's even talk about performance marketing itself. What is performance marketing? Uh, without speaking too much of English, you know, mm -hmm. performance marketing actually focus is on measurable results hmm. not just results but measurable are you engaging in a marketing that you can hardly find how to measure it stop it because if you cannot measure yeah. it it's not done yeah so you need to be very intentional and that is what performance marketing is about is about focusing on measurable results and the ability to allocate resources based on data and performance so when you've been able to accomplish that focus and allocation, then the efficiency now comes in. Efficiency has to do with do, um, getting more out of less or mm -hmm. doing more with less. Mm -hmm. So 
Performance marketing efficiency is a, is, is, is a form of optimization, okay? Making what is good better and what is better best. Yeah. So uh, to answer your question about performance marketing, it's uh, focusing on measurable results and proper allocation of resources in an optimized way, if that's mm. possible. Yeah. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. And, you know, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on some of the elements of that in terms of things that people need to, you know, like the factors that people need to look at? You know, a good example is cost per acquisition, not yeah. cost per conversion. Yeah, Guys, if you're listening or watching, you need to know the difference. Uh, the difference between cost per conversion and cost per acquisition is that with cost per conversion, you are taking revenue into account. You are right. taking other things into account. The, the KPIs that you want to run away from, you are taking that into account. You are Correct. you have sales enablement in mind. So let's Correct. let's let it's important for us to make that description. So some of, what are the, some of the other factors of of performance marketing that you like to talk about? You know, um, I like your perspective, and I think it's going to be different from what people are expecting. So could you give us some of the other factors uh, around uh, around that? Okay, so um, one is cost efficiency. Uh, okay, if I go to cost efficiency, let me go to the cost per acquisition, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Now, um, a lot of marketers, for the want of a better word, seem to turn a blind eye to CPA. Exactly. They rather go, they rather go CPC, which is cost per conversion, than CPA, the cost per acquisition. Because if it costs you $2 to get a, a customer, a client, mm -hmm. and the revenue, revenue now is $1. Mm -hmm. From the go set, or from the set go, you can see that, yes, at that point, um, you're running at a loss because you're yeah, spending less than one yeah. to acquire. Mm -hmm that customer. Yeah. So in the acquisition of that customer, depending on the dynamics of your pricing point, because the other thing that also needs to come into play is the lifetime costs or the lifetime value rather of that yeah. customer. Yeah. So if in the course of the, when you project the lifetime value, calculate the lifetime value of that customer and as a proxy to what other customers are doing, if you don't have your numbers right and you're just looking at the cost per conversion from the cost per acquisition, your CPA, you will quickly know how best to optimize, which is where performance com uh, marketing comes in. It's about focusing on efficiency, focusing on what is working and how to make it better. You know, so that's regarding uh, uh, cost per acquisition. Then the other thing is about cost efficiency. Now, cost efficiency looks at how best can I make use of the budget allotted, you know, for me regarding this campaign, mm. you know? So you have your budgets, your time, and manpower. All these mm. are elements of cost. Mm. And if you're only looking at the cost in terms of the, 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 the USD and mm. you forgo the time and the manpower, then you've not fully captured the cost in running that marketing campaign. So yeah. uh, efficient performance marketing, you know, will make the most available resources maximize their impacts on outcomes. Mm -hmm. I want to end with that. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I like the way you have broken this down. And, you know, like I always say in a few of my episodes, please, if you're listening, don't call yourself a growth marketer if you're not thinking about revenue. Don't call yourself a growth marketer if you are not, if, if you are not working with sales, don't call yourself a growth marketer if you are not being open and transparent and sincere. At you know, if you listen to what Femi said there, he gave an analogy of a loss. Let me drum a bit on that. Even if you are running at a loss, the process of determining that with full transparency and knowing what to do about that is valuable. And that makes you the growth marketer. Don't call yourself a growth marketer if all you care about is impressions. Uh, some people will say cost per impression as if it's, it's something valuable or you're a CPC guy. 
If you are not thinking about revenue, if revenue doesn't keep you up at night as a marketer, don't call yourself a growth marketer. In fact, yeah, does, let me just quickly chip in here. You know, yes, please. Growth marketing, the rationale behind it is experimental. You know, mm -hmm. is about finding what works. Mm -hmm. Is about testing all channels to find the one that works best. Yeah, testing all channels. And testing. All right, testing all channels to know the one that delivers the best. So if you call yourself a growth marketer and you are not interested because delivery also has mm -hmm. to impact the business. We're not mm -hmm. talking of soft metrics now. Exactly. Revenue is one of them. Revenue, you need, you, you, you need to do a marketing that impacts the business of your clients. When you are conversing, begin to ask yourself, which of these channels, in addition to all other soft metrics, which one will also deliver the revenue? Hmm. So I just thought to chip in that. You know, Femi, on a lighter note, we we'll, we'll have to make a pact in this episode that, you know, we, we are going to stay together in this because we are going to get a lot of flack online with regards to, you know, what it takes to become a growth marketer. We are going to get a lot of criticisms, but we are going to stay the course. We, it, is, it is a course we have to stay. Marketing leaders like us need to change the mindset of others to get into that deep end, the deep end that they've always run away from for many years and become the marketer that grow companies. They become the marketer that delivers, you know, commercial value. Are we together on that, Femi? Oh, sure, sure, sure. We're good. together on this. Awesome. That sounds good. Um, when it comes to, you know, uh, marketing return on ad spend and uh, performance marketing efficiency, uh, you know, let me put it this way. People think performance efficiency is financial. W would you agree with that? Uh, yes, no, maybe, and why? So if I hear your question very well, is performance marketing efficiency financial? Yeah. It's more than financial. So if mm. that, if knows we capture that, yeah. Mm. Mm. So performance marketing is more than financial. Uh, financial is just one of the elements that you capture in performance marketing efficiency. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so in terms of the financial efficiency is the return. Mm -hmm. The return uh, on investment regarding that campaign. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. uh, are you talking like the, ROAS? Is that kind of what you're talking about there? And would you want to elaborate? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, because a lot of people con confuse ROAS with ROMS. Mm -hmm. So ROAS, uh, which is the return on advertising spend, it's more focused on a campaign which you are running. Mm -hmm. While ROMS, return on marketing spend, actually encapsulates, you know, all what you have invested or spent as in the course of your marketing activity. So mm -hmm. while the ROAS focuses on campaign, ROMS, you know, looks at a global marketing activity mm -hmm. and because there are other uh, marketing, marketing operations that come under ROMS in addition to your advertising spend. Mm -hmm. So I just want to quickly uh, clear that ROMS mm -hmm. and ROAS are totally different metrics and uh, mm -hmm. one is a subset of the other. I think marketers can chase both. I mean, as your career grows, you can become more of the ROMS guy, but ultimately you need to start from somewhere. And starting from having that immediate ROAS is even great for your mindset, for your career, for the value you are driving. And then over right. time, you can start to, in the process of determining cost per acquisition, you are, you are looking at what is the cost involved in including a, a, a lead nurturing executive, for example. What is the cost in including some of the other things? Uh, what what are even looking at 
the prices of of the package or the product that you are that right. the revenue is coming from what's the right. average order value what was the lifetime value like what's the for example the investment in that product you know cost of goods or services sold i hear somebody here might be telling me uh this is too much for me but it is what it is you know yeah, if, you, if you can if you can nail rms like femi is saying the sky is the limit when you speak, people listen. Do you agree you know with that? Well? Yeah, I, I yeah. do. I do. You know what? Um, it's interesting that um, a lot of people limit marketing to brand marketing. Mm-hmm. You know? And I'm like, guys, brand marketing is just a microcosm of marketing. And mm. when brand managers in quotes you know engage with marketing services providers yeah and they have this very tunnel view about oh is brand as i agree with you branding but in addition to branding there are other activities that had up to help build your brand mm-hmm. so you need to further upgrade you know yourself beyond just brand Management, thinking that it's all about brand marketing. That's awesome, awesome. I, I, again, people will be like, yeah, we already know this, but the lines are drawing thinner every day, and it's important for for marketers to have, you know, to be able to constructively de- determine the the differences there. As we move on here, from your experience, this is another yeah. differentiation question. What's okay. the difference between marketing efficiency and marketing effectiveness? And which one, which one should we embrace, if I would say it that way? Okay. Uh, which one should we embrace? We should embrace the two. Mm. Uh, so, marketing efficiency, uh, like I talked about earlier regarding to performance marketing efficiency, anytime the word efficiency is being used, it's about optimization. It's about getting more, mm. using less. You know, when you say, when you use the the formula for calculating efficiency is Mm -hmm. output over input times 100%. Mm -hmm. So the higher your output and the lower your input, the higher your efficiency. So uh, marketing efficiency uh, just talks about optimization of Mm -hmm. your marketing. That's making good better and making better best. That's all efficiency is about. But when we're talking about marketing effectiveness, that borders down on, are we talking to the right person? Mm -hmm. Is this copy we're using in our messaging, is it communicating the message we intend? And which is why in the course of testing the effectiveness of your marketing, you know, you need to understand the rudiments of what is your customer journey. You need to understand. You, have, you need to have a very good customer understanding. Decision making you process. Need to have the customer purchase journey. Yeah. At each touch point of the customer, what are the need states of the customer? So a lot of things goes into marketing effectiveness. Mm. It is when you've ticked all the boxes. Yeah. That okay, I'm talking to the right person, I'm using the right medium, you know, I'm, I'm reaching the consumer at the right time, at the right mood. Then marketing efficiency can now kick in. How can now that I'm talking to the right person, how yeah. can I make it better? So yeah. effectiveness is getting the right thing done, it's about the yeah. right thing, it's either the right thing or the wrong thing. There is no middle yeah. way between yeah. it. Yeah. If it's either you're talking to the right person or you're talking to the wrong person. So if you are not getting your marketing effectiveness right and you now want to scale, you will scale rubbish. Mm-hmm. We waste so much money. But once you get your marketing effectiveness right, when you get all the elements of your marketing right and it's delivering, then the marketing efficiency now kicks in where you can ask, okay, so what do I need to tweak? Where do I need to tweak 
what do I need to optimize to further increase my output? That mm -hmm. is how I'm going to explain the difference and the relationship between the two. And you're absolutely spot on, sir. I think I like what you mentioned there in terms of the progression and you know what you start with hitting the mark with effectiveness and then optimizing with efficiency so you can really skill if that's what you want to do. Now, back to performance marketing efficiency. I know you are a fractional CMO in some yeah. of your other universes. And yeah. why I like personal, fractional CMOs is because they are not bureaucratic. Like, Correct. I, again, this, is a bit of, this episode is a bit of a tough love to many of the young marketers out there for those concerned. But what idea do you, what, what advice basically do you have for bureaucratic marketers of today? What are the things that they need to stop doing so that they can operate efficiently as marketers? Okay. <laughs> uh, you use a very strong word there, bureaucratic. Yes. That, um, that's why I said it's tough love, you know. They, 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 they well, got to listen. We, we need them to grow. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, firstly, I want to say bureaucratic marketers found themselves in a bureaucratic environment. Hmm. So they being bureaucratic is as a result of the environment in which they found themselves in. So uh, they are in a system that is first level bureaucratic. Hmm. So it's not about the marketers if we have okay. to be very objective, okay? They find themselves within a constraint that doesn't allow them to express themselves the way they would love to. Mm. So, and um, bureaucracy, you know, for me, if I want to find another word for bureaucracy is too much control. Mm. Control itself is expensive. They will not have excessive control. You know, you can be so sure you are incurring so much cost. If there is a way all these bureaucratic systems can man monetize the impact of their bureaucracy or mm. red tipism, bottlenecks on their business, they will think twice and remove yeah. all the, uh, uh, the bottlenecks in these processes. So... Um, bureaucratic marketers in the course of justifying their spend is all a first about results that can be measured. Yeah. Okay. So um, performance marketing would deliver that to you if you are looking for measurable results, you know, yeah. because the, the, the essence of it is that you are intentional from the start. Mm. And you are aligned on what are the things we are measuring and how are we going to measure. Because it's possible for you to have one activity and have different perspective of how to measure it. Yeah. But if you are aligned from the goal set that, look, this is the activity we want to embark on. And this is how we've agreed to measure it. Not that the marketer has his own idea of how it should be measured. And the service provider also has a way he or she thinks to be measured and they both go yeah. their various ways and you now come back and start battling. No, 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 no. I yeah. always prefer, okay, this is it. From yeah. my own view, now you should measure it. From your own view, how do you think? Then we now align that, okay, yeah. these are the things. Otherwise, the first thing you will hear is, oh, it's not working. So performance marketing gives room for measurable results, which I think strongly a marketer that finds him or herself in a bureaucratic setting would love to see. Mm -hmm. uh, performance marketing helps in cost optimization. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, In as much as I don't like using the word cost when it comes to marketing activity, I see it more as an investment. Investment, yeah. yeah. Uh, there are instances where you still incur costs, which really might not be an investment. But um, once you know 
that in the course of your planning, marketing planning, you've seen that, okay, this is a cost I have to incur, okay, mm -hmm. and I'm incurring this cost effectively, mm -hmm. then I now move from effective uh, cost accrual to cost efficiency. Yeah. Make sure that, okay, I'm doing the best to not incur additional costs in the course of this marketing campaign. So uh, mm -hmm. performance marketing efficiency also helps with that. And uh, also more importantly is the ROI focus. You know, performance mm -hmm. marketing efficiency helps you to focus on the return on the investment in this uh, activity you are embarking on or you are engaging in. Mm -hmm. It also uh, enhances data-driven decision making because yeah. that is what performance marketing is all about really performance marketing uh efficiency you look at the data okay this activity this channel this uh process okay is it delivering mm -hmm. is it delivering what i'm expecting if yeah. it's not delivering okay what do i need to tweak where do i need to tweak what do i need to whittle down you know so uh it enhances data driven uh decision making and uh, finally, once you've gotten uh, the right combination of effectiveness and efficiency, then it also prepares you to scale. So you yeah. can be so sure that if at all there are some not so optimal uh, uh, aspect of the process, when you scale, you don't scale nonsense. You scale yeah. a lot of percentage of the good parts of the process. So that's the beauty of uh, mass marketing efficiency. Yeah, I like what you said there about the realignment. Um, not just you know vendor to marketer to team lead to uh, subordinate and alignment, but it's the entire marketing ecosystem even aligning with sales, for example. Right. So it's important for them to, if you really want to re measure the uh, the great revenue that grows the company, then you also need to align with sales and even customer service on the retention side of things as well. So right. I think Correct. of all those points, I, I really like the, what you said there um, with alignment. When it comes to paid search camp marketing campaign, not just paid search, or paid marketing campaigns or paid media campaigns, you are a legend, you know. Um, I'm seeing myself, when I grow up, I want to be like you, as is often yeah. said. But what are the, the available tech tools or tech solutions that allow, you know, B2B, PPC marketers to leverage automation, leverage simplicity, and even leverage strategic efficiency so that they can become better performance marketers. Okay. Uh, there are some very key words you used there. Uh, leverage mm -hmm. automation, simplicity, and strategic efficiency. That's right. There, yeah. there's, a plethora, there's a plethora of tools uh, which um, PPC marketers can use. Uh, but one which comes, you know, top of mind and strong uh, is um, in the Alphabet family. That's the, mm -hmm. the Google Ads, you know, platform, ad management platform. And, uh, you know, I think by July 1st, uh, there will be a migration into the Google Ads 4, you know, mm -hmm. so... Google Ads and uh, the Microsoft advertising platforms, uh, which was formerly Bing Ads, is a very strong ad management platform. Mm -hmm. uh, coming to automation, marketing automation systems for PPC, uh, we have the likes of HubSpot, mm -hmm. uh, Marketo, which allows you to synchronize your campaigns and target specific audiences, you know, to yeah. optimize the spend. And... Uh, we are in the dispensation of AI. Yes. So yeah, uh, there are a lot of it's definitely in these days. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of AI coming in. While some are afraid that uh, AI will take their jobs, mm. uh, I, my belief is that AI will not take your job. It is the person that knows a how to use AI that will take mm. your job. Mm -hmm. You know. Is a person that knows how to use AI that will take your job. Uh, because personally, I just see AI as a tool. Uh, yeah. I don't know 
if you remember back in the days, um, here in Nigeria, uh, calculators were not allowed, you know, in schools. Yeah. Uh, at a time, we were told we needed to learn how to use what we call four-figure tables yeah. in calculating log logarithmic uh, calculations. But there, are, there also, there were calculators that could do it. Why put us through the pain of exactly. using the four-figure table where we can use? So where is the four-figure table today, for heaven's sake? Exactly, you know? yeah. So there, there's a, there, there are a lot of calculators out there. So the same vein, I see the AI as a tool. So it is the more you make yourself acquainted with your calculator that you'll be able to exhaust the features on the calculator. Yeah. So also with your your AI is just a tool. It's like your normal cutlass. If you don't use it, it won't get sharpened. So the more you use it, the more you can, you know, bring up some very good skills in the use of your tools. So uh, I hear so much noise about AI this, AI that. I said, guys, yeah, just think of AI as a calculator, you know, and your life will be much more uh, at peace. So there are a lot of AI-powered uh, optimization technologies for PPC marketers out there, you know, a lot. Um, there is the Adobe Advertising Cloud mm -hmm. and uh, that of Acquisio. Yeah. And uh, also in terms of um, audience targeting and segmentation, which is also very key for PPC, you have uh, the Facebook ads, uh, the mm -hmm. LinkedIn ads, and uh, mm -hmm. the Twitter ads, which yeah. profile so um, uh, uh, ad targeting options. For conversion, tracking, and analytics, yeah, Google still stand tops. And mm -hmm. um, I just want to say to the pe every PPC marketer out there that technology is just a tool. The more you sit with it, the better you become at it. And with time, you know, yeah. the tool itself will not replace you. It is the person that knows how to use the tool that will replace you. Yeah. I, I like your perspective about AI. Um, when I have these conversations and AI comes up, I would like to see how people respond. And uh, you you are well in line with the kind of responses I'm expecting. Ultimately, AI will not take your job if you are at the strategic end. You are the master, Correct. AI is the servant. You tell it what to do. You Correct. run it. You know, Don't be complaining that AI is going to take our jobs when you are just there at the end user area of your career. You are not you are still at the servant level. So definitely servants will, the more efficient servants will replace the other servant, right? Be right. strategic. I thought, it, um, you know, that was very good. And I really, really appreciate that. And I like what you said about analytics. I think that's my favorite part in terms of looking at the tech stack. You need to be able to make sure that analytics is a big part of your digital transformation. Um, that is well-placed, well-oiled spotless as much as possible even before you run any campaign at all do yeah. not run any campaign without your tracking system in place do not do not i cannot you know, overemphasize that enough you know uh running a business without analytics is like driving an airplane without your dashboard <laughs> disaster you are just yeah, they are just disaster waiting to happen. So, your analytics, you should have a dashboard telling you how you are tracking. If you are mm -hmm. running a campaign, running a business, running a department, and you don't have your the right analytics in place, you know, yeah, guy, I don't understand what you're doing. So, yeah. I just thought to keep in that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, actually, I was actually going to dive deep into the analytics end as well to ask, to try to pick your brain uh, with regards to that. You know, yeah, there's the side of please incorporate analytics, but there are some segments of marketers that are just overusing everything. You know, they are just using all the analytics, KPIs that are not needed, solution that is not needed, um, and creativity is lost because people are just basically focusing on the numbers without context. Numbers are supposed to guide you, right? So when it comes to creativity in marketing, 
and not losing that grip in place of data. How do you advise us to have that balance? Basically, to say, I will have my dashboards in terms of, you know, using the airplane example, I have my dashboards, but I also know the nuances of how I'm driving. Are beds flocking around this side? I don't need, the dashboard will not tell me that. I need to see it with my eyes and move away from the way and things like that. So how do we marry analytics and creativity or what I call marketing intelligence and creativity? So a uh, nice question. I actually wrote a piece on this recently because I, mm -hmm. um, I saw the struggle, the tension, and really once purpose is not understood, abuse is inevitable. Yes. Data and creativity should go hand in hand in your marketing operations. Data and creativity, if, because the data informs your creativity. Yeah. And the creativity also generates data to further improve on your creativity. So mm -hmm. I would, we, we, for the want of a better word, it's more of a chicken and an egg. Yeah. They feed into each other. So it shouldn't be a thing of tension at all. Hmm. Most of the AI which we are looking at today has its foundation on data. Yeah. The large language modeling. Mm -hmm. Data. There is a huge amount of data sitting at the base of every AI. They were made to learn so much data. And the more data, the more creative they will be. Mm -hmm. So there shouldn't be any tension, actually. It is only when the marketer is not open to new ideas and new opportunities and new possibilities that we have this tension. You know, yeah. for a well-informed marketer, uh, there should be a sync between creativity and data. Interesting. So I, I like the AI model you used there. Eh? AI is creative. You know, everybody's saying AI is as creative as the human. You can write like a human. Right. You can draw like a human. But it's right. not just drawing alone. It's drawing based on data. So data That's should awesome. inform the direction of your creativity. Data helps That's you it. when you have creative block. Not like, you know, let me give you an example, sir. You see... For example, in the YouTube space, um, in, in my other life, I'm a YouTuber. Sometimes YouTubers are so obsessed with data that their creativity is gone. So you hear people saying, oh, this YouTube thumbnail, this is the way the guy did it. And that is why he has so many views. That may not necessarily be the reason. Uh, sometimes, you know, in data, correlation does not mean implication. That's, right. that's something I just came up with in my head, but that's, that's a quote that I've been, I've been nurturing in my head for a long time when it comes to data. And, but what they do is that they try to copy the same thumbnail thinking it's going to work for them. But they may not know that what might work for them might be different. It may be the content. It may be the length of the content. It may be the style of the content. It may be some other nuances that can so inform to just, their own. To, even, to even chip in there, yeah. they are not privy to the analytics page of the person exactly to know, <laughs> to know to get the data that is making it work for him they are just you know hanging on trying to wing based on what they see the creativity alone yeah. but if they get the data at the back end it will now inform their own creativity on how best to go about it ex ex exactly exactly I, I think i like that context and i think that is where we should approach marketing going forward um, I'm not, I mean, you can do competitive analysis if you can. We have tools like similar web and things like that. But at right. the end of the day, you must be able to look at your own context, your own audience, your own business goals, and all these other nuances to be able to inform the right decision and still keep you creative, you know, which Correct. is really, which is really the goal. Yeah. Um, when it comes to cost, you know, we've mentioned that a bit investment, you know, if I will put it rightly, according to you there, um, for fractional marketing resources. As a fractional marketer, how do you help B2B startups scale their performance marketing with effective strategies? Uh, and I'm saying this to say you're working with, uh, uh, you know, 
a small SaaS startup, for example, they are just raising money. There's not much. They have this amount of marketing, but they want to grow inside out. So how do you uh, help them to make that leap to the okay. next level? Okay, fantastic. So uh, part of my learning, I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. Part mm -hmm. of my learning in the course of offering the CMO service um, is that a lot of businesses are not clear about their customer segments. Let me quickly just chip in this small story uh, of yeah. the monk uh, that sold combs. They said there were sales guys that were giving combs to go sell to a monk, not a monk that sold combs, rather. Mm -hmm. uh, the sales guy was told to go sell combs to monks, and uh, there were like three. Um, one of them was able to sell maybe like one. Mm -hmm. uh, another was able to sell maybe like three. Then the third guy, I think, was able to sell hundreds. And they were like, wow, this same comb. How come you were able to sell one, you two, uh, three, you hundreds, and even still asking for more? Now, yeah. the understanding of the targets the customer segment, you know, will inform how you will deliver the proposition. So mm -hmm. when business owners tell me they are looking for customers, I mm -hmm. said, if we actually, if we look into your data in-house, you are locking some of your customers in your office when you close by the day. <laughs> they were like, I said, yeah. Because some guys are already buying. Who are they? How well do you know the persona of these people beyond yeah. them just buying? If you are capturing the right data, you will know the frequency of purchase, the mm -hmm. basket size, mm -hmm. you know, which these people. So there is enough data in-house to help you make informed decision on mm -hmm. crafting your buyer persona. Mm. And from the analysis of the data in-house, you'll be able to segment the various customers, you know, and the one with the highest, the, 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 the segment that delivers the highest return to you. Yeah. So one of the things I start with, you know, in terms of helping them to be more cost effective is focus on their audience segmentation. Yeah. They need to understand who their customers are. Then we also now try to leverage on digital marketing channels. Now, many people think because there's so much activity on digital marketing, on digital market, marketing and comprises social media marketing, internet marketing, mobile marketing, you know, that's, yeah. oh, they say you can do it yourself, DIY. They just yeah. go in, they burn money, they go in, they burn money, and they come out. It's, uh, you know, it's ridiculous. When you, to, when you go to a barber shop and you see the barber doing his thing, you think it's very easy until you handle the clipper mm -hmm. and you find out that it's not as easy as you thought. Digital marketing is a skill yeah. that it looks easy, does not make it easy. You still yeah. need to train yourself. So, um, we leverage digital marketing channels that are more contextually relevant hmm. for their audience. Yeah. There are some services that you find more of your audience on a particular platform than others, depending on who your segment, who you are targeting. Yeah. For instance, a lot of millennials and Gen Zs have drifted off a group. Mm -hmm. and they are now more on Instagram and TikTok. So if you think because there's a strong affinity for Facebook in this part of the world, and you just focus on Facebook, yes, there are times when, because Meta owns Facebook and Instagram, so some of your ads can spill from uh, Facebook into Instagram. But if you are not intentional yeah. about if you're not intentional about it, you just want that you're just on Facebook and you're not entering or capturing the audience in 
Instagram. So we leverage digital marketing uh, 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 channels to be more cost effective and mm -hmm. also emphasize on content marketing. Yeah. We are in a dispensation of content marketers. The traditional way of advertising is gradually losing its as team to user generated content that's right so uh we leverage on how can you engage with your customers your existing customers to draw in more customers we also look at collaboration with partners and affiliates and in all of this we go back to our dashboard by measuring yeah. continuously that are we on track Okay, which one is not delivering that we thought would deliver? If it's not delivering, okay. Is that something we can do to optimize? If it's not working, we pull the plug on that, plow the yeah. budget into another channel, and like that. So it's a continuous measuring and optimization of our activities. So with all that put together, I think we are able to get to a place where uh, these uh, small and medium-sized businesses are able, you know, to tap and squeeze a lot of value from this fractional CMO uh, solutions which we provide for them. Absolutely. And, and that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, if you're listening now and you want to, you know, get all that again, just again, rewind, take notes, because this is how to do it. In being a fractional CMO allows you to scale you don't have to be a fractional CMO officially as a service. You can be a fractional CMO even within your organization as well and be that go-to efficient guy that the company cannot grow without. Femi, it's been an honor, you know, having you on this podcast and I'm hoping, you know, Thanks. in the next couple of months, we can even have you back if, if possible because really, I really, really enjoyed this. So where can our B2B marketers find you, you know, if they need help marketing at scale? Okay, uh, I'm very strong on LinkedIn. Uh, so you find me on the linkedin.com slash IN slash Olua Femi Adeniva is one word. Mm -hmm. uh, then um, you can also do me an email at briefs, briefs spelled as B for ball, R for Romeo, I India, E England, F Finland, S for Switzerland, briefs at sustmark.com and um, also you can find me on an alternate email oadeniba at gmail.com uh, quickly before I go uh, let me give um, a background to the name of the company sustmark oh yeah um, that would be interesting please do yeah. so, um, before venturing out of paid employment to start my own thing one of the things I see cutting across a lot of businesses doing marketing, promotion, and advertising was the fact that there's a complaint that uh, it's too expensive, it's too, uh, it's too capital intensive, I don't have money, and as such, you find businesses and companies just doing engaging marketing campaigns once, and that's all. Yeah. And I'm like, no, that is not how marketing should be. Marketing should be sustainable, should be ongoing, should be consistent. You know, it's like a plane trying to take off and once it gets airborne, you just pull all the fuel, you leak all the fuel, it crashes and you now start all over again. So, um, SustMark is a, a coinage of sustainable, yeah, sustainable marketing. So, ah, so I've always been like, okay, how can we make marketing more sustainable. And uh, as time went on, you know, there was um, the, the trend or the concept of ESG also yeah. grew, environment, sustainability, and governance, you know? So, and which is also an interesting part of also uh, an area where we are developing capability and capacity right now so that we can help marketers see the ESG angle of their activities, you know? Yeah. So I just yeah. want to chip in that there. Yeah, and, and I think that's the trend even till the end of the decade. I've seen a lot of people mention 
um, running ads as a function of your carbon emission and things like that. I, I, I think I find that interesting. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, guys, if you're listening, uh, thank you for your time. That's all that we have for today. See more episodes at dotslovesmarketing.com and subscribe to Marketing Leadership Podcast on Apple and Spotify. Till next episode, connect the dots. Thank you for listening to the Marketing Leadership Podcast, brought to you by Dots Loves Marketing. There will be links to any resources mentioned in today's show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a five-star review and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode.